Thank you. I'm a neuroscientist who turned into a philosopher. I ended up here at Oxford University and I discovered a very important thing. I'm stupid. Then after a while, I started realizing that all those bright people that made me feel rather stupid, they're also quite stupid. I see in the professors uh, wreck very expensive equipment. They ought to know how it works. I've seen uh, several very intelligent people being outwitted for months by a mouse in their kitchen that they couldn't get rid of. They might be arguing that they had ethical reasons, but actually it was. They couldn't figure out how to catch it. But the academics of Oxford, we, we don't feel bad about that because we're starting to realize that actually we are all stupid. We're probably a very stupid species. At least if you look at all possible intelligent species. The problem is, of course, that we're also very powerful species. And that leads to interesting questions, what we should be doing with ourselves and the world. I'm going to talk about shifting our brains, maybe. The answer is doing something about our stupidity. So there is an old philosophy joke, which I don't know whether it translates well in, uh, into Estonian, but uh, uh, it's a typical discussion with the young student to the philosopher. What is matter? Oh, never mind. What is mind? Oh, it doesn't matter. And uh, that's, of course, a nice little joke, but actually it's a very profound and hard question embodied in that. Explaining what matter is has turned out to be a tremendously hard philosophical problem. And when we finally started making progress on it, it became known as science and kind of moved out of the philosophy department. This happens a lot of the time. As soon as philosophers actually get the hang of something, they start to organize the knowledge and it gets its own department, its own name. It has happened to science, it has happened to history, sociology, psychology, economics, you name it. And all these other departments, they're getting great funding and doing sometimes very good things. And everybody is wondering, why are we still keeping those philosophers around? They never seem to achieve anything. And the, the problem is, of course, in philosophy, what's left? The things we are still a bit uncertain about, where they actually have no clue how to treat it. That's what remains in philosophy. Similarly, the problem, what is mind, has turned out to be a very tricky problem too. And we still are struggling with that. Some psycho psychology and the neuroscience has moved out of the philosophy department, but we're still really scratching our heads about things like consciousness or how it comes that we have free will or no free will, or how, what actually is going on inside our minds. But attempting to answer these kind of joke questions actually lead to very serious consequences. The attempt at answering what's matter led to questions about alchemy, then to chemistry, then to physics. It has allowed us to come up with things like paint, fertilizers, pesticides. Uh, we figured out uh, electromagnetic waves to communicate with or uh, light up our buildings or why not uh, cleave atoms and the result is, of course, we have everything from paint to silicon chips to nuclear weapons. We have completely transformed the world over the past few centuries, thank to, thanks to this investigation into what matter really is. And while the cutting edge is going on in Switzerland, where we're looking for the Higgs boson, the practical consequence of changing the world completely. A medieval person could not recognize the world we are in today because we all travel so widely. And we live to an enormous ancient age thanks to the modern medicine. We think differently thanks to our technologies. And we're under threats from everything, from weird pesticides in our food, over to nuclear war, over to problems about financial crashes and maybe emerging technologies like nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. And that is just because we have been pursuing the question of matter. Now, think about mind. What happens if we actually start figuring out more about our minds and mind in general? I think that these enormous changes we've seen due to matter are going to look pretty trivial compared to the things that happens when we start looking at minds and understanding how to shift them. If we think about our world, we must realize that intelligence is a superpower. It's an amazing superpower that has allowed our species to spread out into every ecosystem on the planet, from the deserts over to the polar regions. Quite often, not by adapting to them, but by creating ecosystems that are suited to us. 
agriculture, for example. We create ecosystems that are really good from a food and aesthetic standpoint for us. Uh, we become a major uh, geological force. Most of erosion of rock today seems to be due to human activity. And the total mass of the human species is about eight times all the other land-living uh, vertebrates. It's about the same mass, actually, as all the fishes and whales in the ocean. We're ridiculously successful as a species. And indeed, we're fixing more nitrogen using technology than the plants and bacteria on Earth is doing. The interesting thing about this is that it's all due to our brains. We're not that different from our monkey, uh, the monkey forefathers. Uh, the only difference is we have a little bit more intelligence, our ability to use tools slightly more flexible, and to communicate in a cumulative manner. We're putting together uh, ideas and spreading them to each other, and good ideas spread further, and we remember them generation by generation. And the result is, of course, this. We're monkeys sitting in uh, the high-voltage cabinet looking at all the shiny things. And not entirely certain whether we should be poking this or that, but that looks really shiny, so let's poke that. <laughs> oh, no thanks. The problem is, of course, some of these things around us are really lethal, and we need to become much better at dealing with that. We want to become a smarter species. One aspect is, of course, to try to turn ourselves smarter. And it actually turns out that individually, it's a good thing to be smart. You avoid making stupid mistakes. Sometimes. Remember what I told you about Oxford professors. Uh, it turns out that intelligence is useful, not just for getting an education, and hence a nice job with a nice salary and so on, but it also predicts, for example, your health. Childhood intelligence predicts health and longevity, but also it predicts your likelihood of being victim of crime. It's not that smart people always avoid misfortune, but rather that dumb people, they tend to have a much lousier lives. It's not that ignorance is bliss. Actually, when you measure happiness, it turns out that less intelligent people are much more unhappy. They have more high rates of divorce, they're more likely to be murder victims. The most interesting thing is that this individual benefit of being intelligent uh, is not that uh, big compared to the societal effect, because a lot of our intelligence is social. It turns out that when you look at the economic impact of a slightly smarter population, it seems to be big. One IQ point is probably worth at least 2% extra in, G in the GDP for a country. And some estimates put it even further up, about 8%. It also incre increases the economic growth rate. However, it also has interesting aspects of uh, improving cooperation. Smarter people are better able to work together and solve problems without violence. Uh, smarter people are better at doing long-term planning and figuring out uh, things that benefit everybody rather than themselves. By becoming smarter, we could actually make the world much nicer. So, the question is, how do we do that? Well, we still don't understand the brain, uh, not to mention the mind, but we started to figure things out. Neuroscience is accelerating at an enormous pace, and we're moving into the era now of really big neuroscience. We're mapping the brain in various ways. We're getting new ways of looking into it. The, 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 we can see into the brain as it's functioning. And we can start figuring out links between intelligence and different brain regions. We might not understand really what intelligence truly is, but we can see things that if we poke this or poke that region, it has certain effects. And then we can try to enhance the good effects. And we're getting increasingly good at the, uh, improving ourselves. There are quite a lot of different ways we can make our brains function better. Some of them are, of course, very classic, like health. Making sure that uh, you know, a young brain gets enough nutrients, avoid parasites, doesn't have the lead in the drinking water, that's a great way of uh, improving the mind. If we could just uh, solve iodine deficiency, we would get literally billions of IQ points more in the world. But we can, of course, improve our minds other ways. Get a good night's sleep. That, for example, improves memory consolidation. So doing an all night before an exam is a stupid idea because you won't consolidate those memories. You will just be tired in the morning for the exam and not remember anything. But we can also do more interesting things by exercise, for example, because it releases growth factors that most likely improve memory and uh, some other mental performance. We can, of course, try to go further. We can try to use schools. And, uh, one year of uh, basic schooling gives you 2.7 IQ points. It levels off eventually, unfortunately, but it's still pretty impressive. It's also a very expensive form of enhancement of our minds. One problem is, of course, schools 
are, besides being expensive to society, they're also somewhat boring to many students. Meanwhile, they just dream about going home and playing computer games, which also train our minds. Our brains are affected by all our experiences. And by modifying these experiences, we can train our brains in different directions. It turns out that avid gamers who play a lot of uh, uh, computer games tend to have better reaction speeds. They tend to have better peripheral and uh, visual attention. They're better at splitting their attention between several things happening at the same time, and so on. Now, the question is, do you become an avid gamer because you already have a superior brain, or do you actually get a superior brain because you play a lot of games? We don't know yet. Uh, people are experimenting, and right now it looks rather promising. It's just that you can't do a little bit of casual, casual gaming. You actually need to go for it quite, quite fiercely to get the really good attention. But in some cases, that can have big effects. For example, there is interesting work on right now about computer games training working memory. Uh, it turns out that working memory is a kind of bottleneck for a lot of our mental processes, including intelligence. And enhancing working memory might actually improve our ability to solve intelligence tests. We don't know whether that me means that you actually would become smarter out in the real world, but at least in the lab, this looks very promising. And of course, making a really appealing computer game you want to play that also makes you smarter. That would be very useful. We have all sorts of old memory techniques also that allow us to memorize enormous amounts of information, entire decks of cards and phone books. But most of them are very specialized, and you need to take the time and attention to go for that. That's slightly problematic. So we want simple solutions because we're stressed modern people who want to do a thousand different things. So of course, another solution is to try to go for drugs. And from a neuroscientific perspective, it's nothing strange that there should be drugs that improve our cognition. After all, our thinking is happening in a biological organ, the brain, which can be affected in various ways. And we have been doing that for a very, very long time. After all, caffeine and nicotine, most people don't recognize them normally as cognition-enhancing drugs, but they are. Caffeine, the coffee we've been drinking uh, all day, well, that uh, prevents our receptors from noticing how tired we are and make us slightly more alert. Nicotine, for those who smoke or take uh, uh, snuff, well, it binds to the, uh, the certain receptors and affects attention and memory. We can, of course, develop pharmaceuticals that have less uh, strong side effects. There are Alzheimer's medication, for example, that can go for the cholinergic system and hence improve memory. That's very useful if you have Alzheimer's. But they might also enhance normal people, and some normal people do take them and get beneficial effects. We have drugs like Ritalin, intended for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which focuses attention and is stimulating in normal people. Now, stimulation and the focused attention, that's really useful if you will need to write papers. So it's not un uncommon for students in some university to use them. The drug modafinil, intended to treat the sleep disorder uh, narcolepsy, also seems to improve some of our functions in the frontal lobe, our ability to plan and stay awake. So these drugs are, of course, quite controversial. And they have right now a side effect of uh, medical uh, development. We haven't been focused on actually making enhancers, but as we understand the brain better, we're going to figure out some of the trade-offs we might be making use of to make better enhancement drugs. There are other ways, of course. We can stimulate parts of the surface of the brain using electromagnetic fields, either like this uh, thing, a transcranial magnetic stimulator, or by sending electric currents. And that can, again, improve memory, and then you can affect the visual perception. Or you can tune out parts of the brain that are actually not helping you for a particular task. It turns out that turning off some parts of your frontal lobe makes you better at correcting spelling errors because you don't care about the meaning of words, you just care about how they are written. Another area, and you become better at creative tasks because apparently some of the critical functions keeping us down gets less, gets less active. The scary part is the simple electric current thing is a fairly easy thing to build, and people are probably already using it and testing it. We don't know the long-term effects, and we need to figure that one out. We can, of course, do more futuristic things, like genetic engineering. This mouse, for example, has extra receptors that gives it better memory, but also a bit of extra pain uh, sensitivity. There are quite often interesting trade-offs going on. We have evolved to be fairly optimal for a Stone Age environment, and now we're living in a different environment. We might change these trade-offs. After all, we don't get hurt that often these days, so we might stand to have a little bit extra pain if it helps us remember complex information better. 
But that is individual. Some of us would disagree. We can do even more cool things with genetic engineering, like optogenetics, making neurons light sensitive, so you can send light signals into them and control their activity. Or add uh, brain interfaces that allow you to control a computer with your brain. Again, it's going to take a long while before these technologies are really consumer products, before we have a killer application. Everybody will want to be willing to have brain surgery to get. It better be a very good application. But I think it's going to happen eventually. Uh, we're going to figure out more and more useful things, whether that is control of our attention, control of our appetite. After all, they evolved for a world where starvation was ever present. So that's why we tend to eat a little bit too much and exercise too little or other completely unexpected uses. We have a long history of uh, trying to enhance ourselves, whether it's using herbs uh, or whether it's uh, trying to use memory art or futuristic technologies. The interesting thing is that we're moving into a world now where we have more and more advanced neurotechnologies that allow us to sh shift who we are, to actually determine a bit of our function. We're still far away. Psychiatry and psychology and education know how, far, how much trouble they have in figuring things out. Neuroscientists are similarly tearing their hair over what the brain is doing. But we're advancing quite quickly, and I think we're going to see a fundamental shift rather soon as we start applying neurotechnologies. That's going to lead to interesting controversies. This, for example, is a picture of a drug bust uh, from about 200 years old uh, in Stockholm. Uh, and the police are grabbing this party, dealing with the drug coffee. It was mostly tax reasons, actually, why it was banned. But people have been debating the ethics of people enhancing themselves for a long time. But the real challenge is, of course, with these technologies, we get options on who we are. If we can actually change our minds, change our personalities, who do we want to become? And who do we allow you know, to influence this? The big battles of the 20th century were about the control of uh, industry and our social institutions. But as we're moving more and more into a world dominated by creative industries, well, the industry is in our head, which means that controlling creativity, controlling uh, human capital, and the development of human capital become the big political issues. And that means that the new battles are going to be about our minds. We are still very much monkeys trying to figure things out. We are kind of the most stupid species possible that could develop a technological civilization. We haven't evolved very far since we got to this threshold and started expanding across the world. But now we can start turning our technology inwards and develop ourselves. In the future, our technology and control over matter is making the material world more and more like software. We can redefine it, but we are matter. We are a matter that can re change itself. And in such a world, the only thing that is important is our imagination, our vision, what we want to do. So that's why we should choose the best of brains.